so welcome there will be lecture number 11 which means that we are nearing the end of our course i will proceed with a description of dissipative quantum mechanics and uh, what i would like to address today systems which differ from the oscillator we looked at. We know from uh, very first lectures of our course that oscillators are special since they are described by linear equations that gave us so much possibilities. We could easily build up field theory uh, for that. Uh, if uh, the systems are not linear, there are always complications that comes on classical side and that comes on quantum side naturally uh, but well uh, it's uh, complications which are eventually interesting so i will start with uh, changing the oscillator to somewhat more general and i will argue that most interesting case which is not reduced to an oscillator is a case of two level system or a qubit. So we will concentrate on a qubit in an environment which will provide dissipation and friction. And uh, for historical reasons, it's called spin boson model. Spin boson model is not solvable nobody knows all the details of this model but there is a certain limit which we can elaborate and where we can get a lots of new insights about transitions in the present in the presence of dissipation fortunately we have all techniques all elements to assess the situation just, you know, with our hands without making any assumptions. So we will work step by step. We will consider shifted oscillators, oscillators which are shifted in path of transition. We will understand the properties of the wave function. We understand what shake up is. We will introduce a function which is uh, related to energy losses of a system in course of a transition p of e p of e that will be important we will relate it to transition rate we will learn quite some strange interesting things in particular, we will talk about orthogonality catastrophe, understanding that uh, not all the states are eventually quantum mechanical. Uh, the states which, uh, from which one could make a superposition occasionally becomes orthogonal. And this is the essence of catastrophe. We will learn a sophisticated classification of all possible environments which has been proposed by Leggett sub and superomic Schmidt transition it all is related to classification of the environment good so there is a challenging plan for today Let us proceed. Let me first um, give an extended argumentation why it is interesting to look at qubits, how qubits can emerge in different situations. All right. So let's take 
something which we have started a week ago. Let's take them to oscillator. And uh, let me recall what the days. We have a particle in a potential, right? It can exhibit oscillations and simultaneously friction force is acting on this particle, causing dissipation, causing uh, damping of the oscillations. We have understood that, we have fantasized that, we have found uh, fluctuations, uh, quantum fluctuations of the system. Everything is understood, but again, uh, this system is described by linear equations, quantum mechanically and uh, classically as well. Sure, let's do something different. Let us uh, complicate the oscillator. Uh, first, we can complicate uh, the potential. Say instead of parabolic potential, we can make it uh, nonlinear. We can make it uh, somehow like this. Yeah, but if you do it like this, it's not uh, you know a qualitative change. We'll find some corrections uh, to the uh, observables of the system. Uh, who cares much? What is an example of non-trivial change of potential is what I plot here, right? It is a potential which has two wells instead of one, two possible minima. They can be precisely aligned or they could differ a bit in uh, energy, in height. Uh, it is a qualitative difference we look at. Classically, this, this system um, can be in two states. So a particle can stuck here in one well or in another well in distinction from this one. So we would like to figure out what is, uh, what friction does to the system, how it is affected by dissipation. And uh, right, uh, I, do not want to talk about all states in this two wells. I would like to uh, do something simpler, more elementary, and perhaps more important. So what I would do, I would quantize states in each well. Each well works like an oscillator. But I would particularly concentrate on two lower systems, lower states in this system. Good. So it will be a two level system, two state system, also in quantum mechanical sense. So we will concentrate on this because it's qualitative, uh, qualitatively different. Uh, another example of uh, a system which is qualitatively different is, for instance, periodic potential. So it has infinitely many minima. But well, in order to understand infinite number of minima, one should uh, understand uh, well, two minima first, perhaps two neighbor minima. So this is an uh, important step in understanding this system as well. And the results uh, eventually happen to be very similar. 
Uh, good. So, what else? Uh, first of all, let me uh, mention that there's no problem with this extension, with this complication. Uh, we don't have to reinvent the quantization uh, schemes. Uh, for instance, if I would like to modify this potential instead of quadratic potential, uh, have something more complex. Uh, well, I would just put here arbitrary potential instead of uh, linear term. Fine, I will keep the same friction force, which is uh, related to the environment and uh, which is made from uh, apparatus of the bus of the environment. So the quantization scheme will stay the same. And we wanted to do so because uh, by definition, the correct description of friction should not depend on the details of the bus. Fine. So I hope you uh, are motivated enough. Are there any questions concerning this motivation concerning our task for today. So I've seen quite some people, but well, uh, uh, apparently nobody has uh, questions. All clear for now. Very good, very good. Then let us make it less clear, at least uh, let me attempt to make it less clear. To solve these problems with Windows with the Zoom system. Ooh, no, 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 no. Uh, let me. First, understand two limits about two state system. It will be a preview of the result we will get at some stage. Uh, but let me first argue about this in very simple terms without much formulas. Let me recall what we will have in this. Uh, to well potential in quantum case. Uh, right, sir. As uh, I promise, I um, restrict uh, myself by two low line states or two states in uh, one well. And what we will uh, understand, uh, what quantum mechanics uh, says us, they will be most likely delocalized, provided they're really at the same uh, energy level. They will form superpositions and thereby their energies will be split. Right? That's perhaps one of the first impulses systems uh, which you have started in quantum mechanics. It's uh, usually called the diatomic molecule. Then there are two atomic sides, an electron, um, and an electron on the sides, and it can uh, be found in either plus or minus superposition. In both superpositions, there are equal weights uh, to find an electron, a particle in mass wells. So, in this case, we expect uh, the system to be delocalized between the wells. Now, let me uh, forget quantum mechanics. Let me sw switch on my health reasoning 
sir, I just uh, have a classical potential with two wells, use friction. Then I uh, see whatever observe from experiment that the system can be in two distinct states. Once you put a particle here, it will stay forever. Uh, if there are no fluctuations or there are no kicks, uh, right, it will stay forever. Either on the left or on the right. Two states, it works as a classical memory cell. A um, little bit like these two superpositions. If you put the system in one of the superpositions, it will stay there forever. There is no decay. So, of course, both states are uh, ideal and can easily uh, figure out what would be non idealities. If you look at a quantum system, one can imagine there is some decay, right? Dissipation, so it won't stay at upper level, it will decay to lower level. Right? Uh, also, this system, classical system, if you switch on quantum effects, they can be tunneled into this barrier, so it will try to get delocalized. Whether it works or not, that's what we need to investigate. Right, so these two limits are clear for us. Let us put some formulas and understand how one can approach both these limits and what we can have in between. Sir, is it less clear finally, or is it still clear? Uh, good, yeah, but yeah, it, it was not my intention to say something difficult. Uh, let us see, let me remind you something about qubit. I'm sure that you have heard about qubit in the beginning of your quantum education. We have repeated it, uh, uh, I guess, I believe it was first lecture. Yeah, sure, it was the first when we refreshed the whole quantum mechanics. Now let me uh, recall um, quantum mechanics of qubit again, because I will need some notations, some details. So let me make a Hamiltonian for this qubit, All right? And I, I, I don't want to keep the levels at the same energy. I would like to have extra parameter epsilon, which I can change and uh, make one of the levels higher or vice versa. And in addition to that, I have tunneling between the valves. So what kind of Hamiltonian can stop? This one. Two by two matrix, as it has to be for two uh, for a system of two states. Uh, right, that uh, epsilon is in diagonal. Assuming the basis uh, when we have states uh, on the right and on the left. Uh, good. Uh, then there was no diagonal element which mixes the states, which wants to make superpositions. Good. What we can do with this Hamiltonian? Well, we can diagonalize it, find energies. Very good. And we can also find uh, resulting eigenstates. So there will be two states, upper superposition, down superposition, 
uh, let us see if I would like to write to, to write the formulas. I would introduce a convenient angle, which depends on the ratio between the energy bias epsilon and tunneling. Uh, I will get this expression for two-way functions plus minus uh, kind of uh, indicates the difference between them. So this quantum coherence to eigenfunctions, uh, eigenstates. Uh, if we would like to, if you would apply some microwaves, we will have good resonance between these two states. Uh, and also the states tend to be delicalized, right? One can um, kind of uh, go to the lowest well and figure out what would be probability to find the particle in uh, upper well from classical uh, from the point of view of classical mechanics it's just madness you would never find a particle uh, so far from uh, this and uh, at high energy but you can this way function tells you very explicitly. So the probability to be an island well is eventually like this. I'd like to, and I will use it for uh, in my lecture there, I'd like to consider a simple case when um, epsilon is uh, quite bigger than delta. So delocalization is small in this case, right? Delocalization is small, but still, uh, still it persists. It's a small number, but there is delocalization. There is finite probability to find a particle in a alien well. Good. So this quantum mechanical uh, description is not compatible with dissipation, energy is conserved, uh, quantum coherence is preserved. Uh, right, the question, so what do you mean with stationary states at good resonance? There is no at here. Uh, sure, uh, any Hamiltonian has stationary states. What does it mean in quantum mechanics? It means energy levels. Uh, my intention was to write straight lines. Huh? It, uh, it, uh, I have a triplet in one case. Good, I have a system of uh, energy levels. These energy levels do not decay which means that they are determined with infinitesimal width. So, if I would like to shape, to influence my system, I would come with certain frequency. And uh, depending on this frequency, depending on the frequency of the signal, I can cause transitions between these two states. And in ideal quantum mechanical system, this resonance is infinitesimally thin. So it's good. Bad resonance, and we will see the examples. Bad resonance would respond to very broad resonance field. That's how, by the way, that's how quantum mechanics, uh, the notion of quantized states, came about. They've been looking at uh, absorption emission spectra of the gases. 
and they have seen very thin spectral lines, very thin absorption lines. Signature of quantum state is a good resonance. Does this uh, answer your question, Tim? All right. Another, no, okay. So it doesn't apply that epsilon is nearly zero. Fine. Uh, let me go further. Let me consider alternative example of a qubit, which would be rather unusual. Nevertheless, you will understand in a second that this is uh, uh, this actually is the same qubit, but in a bit uh, different circumstances. Uh, first of all, I would like to arrange a circuit with dissipation. You remember it uh, worked last time. So I have, for instance, a resonator made from capacitance and inductance. I will put some resistance in series to provide dissipation. I could even include a voltage source to be able to excite this uh, oscillator. Uh, now let us uh, sophisticate the situation and let us include electron tunneling over here. So what is a capacitor is uh, two metals separated by insulator. So um, it's uh, a barrier for electrons to get. But we can imagine that uh, some tunneling would happen between the states of two metals. And where is the qubit? The qubit actually comes about, we can understand that uh, for any electron transfer, we still work with two states. There could be very many such states here and here, but if you concentrate on a single transition, we could look at two states only and forget ab uh, about uh, all other states. That's how we can implement qubit model also in this very different situation. Right. And to, to put it more general, anytime we are talking about a transition in quantum mechanics, it is a transition between two states in presence of dissipation. So we can always implement the reasoning or the qubit. Good, was relatively important point for general understanding. I hope you got it. Let's see, oh. I should uh, accelerate a bit, I'm afraid. Um, oh. If it's uh, if it becomes uh, too fast, please stop me. Right. Having said so much, I can turn to formulas. Let me formulate now spin boson model. And let us uh, find uh, in its mathematical description all uh, ingredients I have discussed. So, the Hamiltonian is a sum of two parts. Sorry, three. 
uh, I could have, I should be able to count till three. Um, anyway, uh, I did. Uh, first part is a Hamiltonian of a qubit. So we have two states, the Hamiltonian two by two matrix in the space of these two states. All right, we need to provide friction, we need to provide dissipation. To this end, we require a bus. We require a bosonic bus. It's uh, so much uh, convenient. Uh, and uh, right, we write uh, standard Hamiltonian of non interacting bosons. So M uh, numbers modes and modes are many, they form continuous spectrum of corresponding eigenfrequencies. Right. Next to it, we need a coupling. We need a friction force. The force we will uh, make from the environment as we did before. It's a linear combination of uh, bosonic modes with some coefficients, coupling coefficient C. We still have to make sense of the C's. And what comes with this is in fact a displacement. Oh, let me first recall that normally we would have here in classical mechanics or quantum mechanics, we will have a displacement coming with a force. Now let me uh, come back to original picture of the well potential and let me put some coordinate characterizing these two wells. And uh, if I'm really talking about two states and the wells of the potential, then understand that X displacement becomes discrete right there are only two values uh, if i look here i would have to write q naught minus q naught and u naught right so it's the same formula as for harmonic liter for classic uh, for quantization of dissipative harmonic oscillator but now the displacement has been quantized. Right? Let us make sense out of the C's. Uh, we can do it similar like we did before. Uh, let me now uh, move let me now do the following. Uh, let me just not to let this particle to be in this in the potential. Let me grab the particle and let me move artificially in the potential. Let me change this displacement. I could change it in a harmonic fashion and get reaction from the environment on this displacement, get force. And I can characterize the situation with a, as we always did, with a susceptibility. And I can uh, draw the same reasoning as I did before for uh, uh, damp oscillator. And I can come up with the following formula. What does it do? It relates imaginary part of the susceptibility to CMs. 
the amps at modes with a frequency close to given frequency omega. So that completely characterizes, I don't need more details about CMs. I can always use this formula to make sense out of this matter. Good. That is uh, the model. Let me get again through the steps, spin boson model. First, why it is uh, called spin? That's because at the stage of formulation, people didn't think much about qubits, or whatever, what we call qubit now, they called spin. Electron spin is an example of two level system. Right, boson, because we use bosonic environment, and this uh, is here, so the qubits, spin, uh, environment, which is bosonic coupling, was a bit difficult place. But with uh, our experience with damped oscillator, we can figure out what is this. We can characterize this coupling uh, in physical terms using the susceptibility. Again, what susceptibility? We artificially move this um, particle, this system. We look at the reaction that gives us susceptibility. Um, so I have formulated spin boson model. Any questions about this? Is it still clear? Okay, let's go on. Uh, is there a specific reason why X Z power lists are used in the Hamiltonian. Uh, it is uh, a simplification of more general spin boson model. In principle, one can, of course, add. Uh, Another sigma matrix, uh, don't know, tell me the coefficient uh, delta one, sigma y. In addition, one can, in principle, couple all sigma matrices with very different process. Each is characterized by uh, by its own susceptibility. So that one can complicate spin boson model along these lines. But so far, the research has shown that uh, this compli complication doesn't lead to any qualitative qualitative new things like uh, deformation of the potential didn't lead to qualitatively new things or them to selector. That's why we concentrate on spin model as it stands. Good, but even in this uh, simple way, uh, simplistic way, uh, the spin boson model cannot be exactly solvable. One can do something with a computer, but it's also difficult to understand computer results. So we will turn to a simple limit where we can do everything with our hands. Uh, we will formulate this limit. First, uh, let me give an example from um, electric circuits. We come back to this um, electron tunneling. So electrons tunneling between the plates of the capacitor 
in this case, uh, the coordinate is a charge transferred between the planes. What is the force? The force and coordinate always come to Hamiltonian together. Here, the charge comes with voltage. Voltage is generalized first corresponding to the charge. So, what we need to know now is a proportionality coefficient between current, which would push through capacitor, and voltage response. This is given by the impedance of this circuit. And as with, as with any impedance, you can make it out of capacitor, inductance, and uh, resistor. And the CMs, and uh, there were several uh, examinations which are related to this. Uh, this uh, CMs can be easily computed for any electric circuit where you know the impedance. Provided there is a real part of this uh, impedance, which means that there must be a resistor for here. Good, uh, that was the example. Uh, let me formulate a limit. I will be working this. Namely, I will assume that the tunneling is much smaller than the other energy parameter in the system, much smaller than the bias. <coughs> and let me first really go to the limit. Let me first assume that delta is precisely zero. Or then uh, the Hamiltonian of spin bars and model can be solved as a piece of cake. Why is it sure? If there's no tunneling, there are no transitions between different states of equilibrium. Right? If there are no transitions, these states just do not talk to each other and they can be calculated separately. In this, in this sense, are classical states. So then I will write the Hamiltonian for each in this classical state. Um, what I have left with uh, is a Hamiltonian for both and this is both and bass. That's what we know. What comes from the coupling? This comes from the coupling. Plus minus is the position of the qubit. Q naught is its coordinate. Plus minus Q naught. Now let me understand that uh, what I do now is that I'm shifting the oscillator. Let me give a simple analogy, which uh, you all know. Let me talk about uh, just parabolic uh, potentials. So I take parabolic potential and I add a linear term to it. Parabola plus linear term. What do I get? That we already know. I still get a parabola. But it will be shifted with respect to X and with respect to energy. That's how we write it. Perhaps you remember it from school. If you have this, you can write it as a shift in position 
and if you want it as a shift in energy. That's how we will deal with these oscillators. All right. So let me repeat a, a, a particle in state plasma plus or minus just shift the oscillators of the bus and it shifts it in two different, uh, two different uh, directions that Very good. So let me go on with the lecture. What did we do before the break? We understood that in the no tunneling limit, we just have separate states without transition. We can characterize each state as a state where all oscillators in the bus have been shifted. All right, let us figure out the shift. That's how we will figure out the shift in uh, a parabolic potential with numbers. Hope everybody remember this. Uh, let me uh, uh, demonstrate that this quantum thing is bad and it's a signal law. Sure, what do I have to do? I have to assume that um, the boson operators are shifted. They get, as we did it for coherent states, they get a classical addition. Plus minus, depending on the state. Good, and I substitute this in the expression and I will choose lambdas in such a way that the result in Hamiltonian will be deadly, us uh, 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 deadly u usual, right? Something which we have seen thousand times, just the Hamiltonian of uh, non-interacting bosons, right? So I introduced new apparatus, bar shift, got familiar form, can quantize, make wave functions, writes on the point that the shift is different for two states of the qubit. And lambdas are related to coupling constants, uh, frequencies like this. Fine. Uh, right, let me describe this uh, situation as a situation of two separate vacuums. Uh, how can? So the qubit can be either in state plus or state minus on the left or on the right. And for each situation, we have the ground state, we have a vacuum vacuum of bosons but boson apparatus look they are different for two directions which means the vacuum will be different how to figure out what is this let us uh, use the definition of the vacuum for minus position of the cube this is a definition. Whatever I try to annihilate in vacuum, it doesn't work. It gives me zero. Let me now use this to express B minus in terms of B plus and the constant. That's the question I have now for 
the vacuum. And uh, who can help me? We have seen this equation in the course recently. What was that about? In which context did we see this equation? Yes, precisely, Muhammad. That was in the context of coherent state. In fact, this is a definition of coherent state. Uh, a function of annihilation operator. B is now annihilation uh, operator for last situation for vacuum plus, which means that vacuum minus is a coherent state with respect to vacuum plus. So it's vacuum plus plus superposition of uh, all uh, excited states. The same is, of course, for vacuum plus with respect to vacuum minus. But these two vacua are coherent states with respect to one each other. Which greatly simplifies all, 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 all algebras I would like to do. Flashback, coherent state. This is the definition eigenfunction of an relation uh, operator. And this is explicit formula for the coherent state. Uh, what I put here is the average number of excitations in coherent state, which is related to parameter lambda as it stands. Good, as I already said, each of the vacuums is a coherent state with respect to another vacuum. Is a superposition of uh, the states of another vacuum. Uh, fine, but if we don't have any transitions between these two vacuum, it doesn't matter. We need to have some transitions, we need to do something with the system. And uh, what I will start doing, I would just shift a single oscillator and uh, we'll see what happens. We'll consider situation in physical terms. Good, first let me understand the situation at classical level. So there is a particle in my oscillator. Uh, it is in position uh, minus. Uh, potential corresponds to minus position, and I quickly shift the, posi uh, the um, position of the oscillator to plus. Hmm? Right. Then we'll see that at least classical particle with respect to new position in a, in a very high energy state, it will oscillate accordingly. So, uh, shake up, a uh, fast shift has brought an oscillator to an excited state. Fine. That's classical. Let's do it quantum mechanically. Uh, in this case, this is a uh, projection of the initial wave function, ground state, onto all possible states of harmonic oscillator in a new position, right? Then we can get uh, probabilities to get energy E in the course of this shape. Since uh, I can only excite quantized energy, 
this probability will be quantized. It will be a set of uh, delta functions for this set, uh, single oscillator mode. The coefficients in front of this delta function can be computed through Cahillon stacks. And they correspond to statistics we have uh, already mentioned several times in this course, they will correspond to Poisson statistics. Poisson statistics characterizing independent events corresponding to this expression. So this is a uh, uh, probability for certain number of uh, average uh this is a probability for a certain value of parameter which is average number of bosons this function depends on this parameter if this parameter is very small that then uh, the biggest probability is not to lose any energy and there's some small probability to lose one two three four times and uh, this plot is uh, for a particular value of uh, average n and bar. And uh, ladies and gentlemen, please tell me what is this value? Just, you know, control question to check your attention. So this is distribution. The parameter in the distribution is the average value of quantum. Okay, the average number of bosons, clear. This is a plot. What is n bar in this case? Look at the plots. Tell me what's average number of bosons. Yeah. Okay, four, three. Yeah, it is uh, close to reality. Yeah, if I uh, go you, I, will, I would try to approximate the preservation function somehow. Uh, what I would get, yeah, somehow close to three. Uh, perhaps two and eight doesn't matter any answer is uh, accurate with some accuracy only accurate with some accuracy good you got it you're attentive thank you it's about three um let us uh, see that was a story about a single solution now as already many several times in this course we go boldly from single oscillator to many infinitely many and let us figure out what the probability to shake out to lose energy shaking up all these oscillators The expression looks long, but in fact, it's uh, all the elements is of this. So this energy have to be uh, have to consist of excitations in each mode M. For each M, we have certain number of excitations. The probabilities of this N M are given through average number of excitations in each mode right so it also, also also not there eventually as the expression is terrible we will sum it up later we will make sense of it uh, but let me first concentrate on simple case 
when we can do it immediately. Uh, let me look at the probability to have no excitations in the course of the top. So what do I do here? I have to put all n m to zero. And this will be that. So I will come up with this answer. Probability to shake not up none. It is exponent. It's always positive as the probability should should uh, be. It is also smaller than one, as any probability should be. And uh, what is to notice if I have to average if, if I in average excite many bosons, this is big. The probability is small. It is exponentially small. Right. Now the idea is to take continuous limit of the bosonic spectrum and see uh, what is happening. Right. M here, and I uh, do my best to keep it consistent. M here. And in many formulas at this uh, lecture, numbers, modes. So the environment consists of many, many independent bosonic modes. And uh, if I interact with all these modes, I have to sum up on them. All right? Is it clear to everybody now? Fine. Uh, so there are contributions from each mode. Let me get to this person, Anderson, which uh, looked up at this simple formula and uh, make uh, a very interesting sense of that problem. He understood that this might indicate oxygenality catastrophe. So we are, when we uh, are talking about probability to have no shake up, in fact, this probability is given through overlap between two vacua, right? And in principle, whatever the states, two different states, we expect some overlap. These states doesn't have to be orthogonal. But if the sum over all modes eventually diverges. And that can do it for infinite number of modes for continuous limit. This vacuum become orthogonal. This is what is called orthogonality catastrophe. It means that tunneling between these states is impossible unless one provides some energy loss, some dissipation. Uh, so some energy to overcome the dissipation. Otherwise, the dissipation makes these two states orthogonal. So let us see when this can happen. In order to do so, I need to revert all these formulas. I have to uh, compute shifts in terms of coupling constants. <coughs> I have to say that gives me average numbers. I have to sum up overall M's. Uh, I change summation by integration over energy. 
and then I can implement the formula which we have. So this uh, number which enters Anderson orthogonality catastrophe is an integral over imaginary part of the susceptibility eventually with om uh, omega squared. And if this integral diverges as at low and upper limit, the vacuum are orthogonal. If it converges, no such luck or whatever, no such disaster. There is a possibility of elastic tunneling, tunneling without energy loss between this vacuum. <coughs> Good. That was a psychoanalytic catastrophe. Uh, that uh, uh, was uh, about that time very interesting example how dissipation can completely change the picture, leave, uh, leading to um, qualitative change of uh, the properties of quantum mechanical states. Uh, right. That's important thing. Let me get now this P of E in a marginal situation for any energy. The calculation is a bit long, perhaps cumbersome, but again, each step you can do and you can eventually compute everything by uh, yourself. It's not, you know, high mass. Eh? So we start with this. Then we uh, need the problem with summation of this delta function. It's very handy to circumvent this problem, uh, introducing an extra integration, which would make uh, exponent instead of delta function. And if we can run this integration over t, this t will give us this uh, exponent. But uh, will give us this delta function. What is the use of exponents? Now we can sum up over all m and m separately and over each mode separately. So we will come to this expression. Uh, let's see, yeah, it's the same, but I like this expression better. Now I can concentrate on the sum and I also rewrite it as an integral over energy. Is a trick which I just implied for Anderson model. This quantity is expressed in terms of dissipation. So this is an answer. It's have an answer, it's uh, non-linear, but it's an uh, exact answer for P of E in the presence of dissipative environment. Everything is expressed in terms of uh, susceptibility of this environment. One needs to know its frequency dependence. And we will look at all possible answers, qualitatively different answers one can get in the scheme. Right, uh, the same answer can be written in a little bit more constructive form. It is still, uh, the formula is still not easy, but that is, um, a more physical way to understand it. It can be written like this. So there's a probability to emit energy exciting arbitrary number of bosons. And here is a probability 
to emit that much energy emitting a single boson. You get this probability if you go to the limit of small couplings. And this probability, E1 of E, can be conveniently expressed in terms of susceptibility in terms of imaginary part of the susceptibility, which is a little bit more convenient than using this function j. Um, all right, so now we'll try to look at different answers, general answers uh, to this formula. Um, before looking at it, let me understand the simple thing, which will be very helpful. Uh, now we can um, come back to spin boson model and assume small but finite transition coming rate. We still assume uh, shifted, uh, shifted uh, potentials. There is uh, the energy difference between the states is mainly this epsilon. Epsilon is uh, much bigger than delta. So, uh, look how to organize the transition of this point. Well, one is initially in this state. It wants to go there. So this much energy has to go to the environment. Has to go to, to the environment simultaneously with shifting the vacuum. So it has to be absorbed by the environment but the probability of absorbing, we know, this is P of E function, which we have calculated, right? That's how we come to the formula for the transition rate from upper state to the lower state. Uh, I guess I miss a strip here again. Uh, so it is just proportional to P of E. That's the way kind of to observe it experimentally. Uh, right, if the coupling is small, then one photon process dominates uh, transition rate is due to single photon. Uh, did I say photon? Uh, I wrote photon. It must be like photon, whatever, boson. If one boson process dominates, then the transition rate is just uh, involves just P1. Uh, fine. Another signature, delocalization. Probability to um, remain in the same, well, if you remember the um, uh, homework problem, it was precisely uh, same career. Calculation. Yeah. That time we looked at the impurity in different touch states. Now we have only two states, plus and minus. And we would like to estimate the probability for a system to be in an uh, island valve. It uh, can be seen as a small correction in this case, proportional to delta squared since the levels are very much um, separated. Good, one can do this in a way we did for that impurity problem. Computing these coefficients, so um, uh, small delta perturbation makes um, uh, corrections to the ground state makes it mixing, mixed with the uh, other states. One needs to compute coefficients of this mixing. So the probability is the sum of these coefficients. Right, for impurity, you summed up over different K states. Here we need to sum up over all possible states of the environment. And the answer can be expressed again 
in terms of P of E. So P of E is useful for transition rates, but also for delocalization probability. Uh, we can run a fast foolproof check of this formula. If the interaction with the uh, boson bass is absent, P of E is just delta function of energy, no energy loss. Right, we put delta function here and we reproduce the formula for delocalization, which we got from qubits. Fine. Let me still give, uh, I kind of accelerate uh, already. Let me give you all possible answers, right? So I don't want to elaborate on single answer. I would like to just give all possible answers, which are possible in this situation. Right. It turns out that P of E can be of two main types. And there's interesting borderline practical uh, case, which is in between these two cases. So cases one, two, and cases case three, it's a borderline between these two topics. First case, let me call it classical case. In this case, there's orthogonality catastrophe. If I sketch, P of E, it has nothing at zero. And eventually one can see that e, e, even close to zero, it has almost nothing, it's exponentially suppressed over there. Uh, P of E has to be normalized. So I have to cut it at some energy somewhere here. Um, good. Then opposite case, quantum mechanical case. In this case, I would mostly not to lose energy. Interaction with environment is too small. So P of E would have a tremendous peak at delta at uh, zero energy. And then there's perhaps a some tail, which is due to energy loss with a one boson process. Uh, good. So there's nothing here, or oh, delta peak. How one can imagine a borderline? Interestingly enough, the borderline is power law dependence of P of E at low energies. Here I gave two examples, red line or green line. Both functions look very different. One is rising, another one is uh, going to zero at, at zero. But both have power law dependencies at zero which makes them borderline between, uh, between um, one and two. So it becomes a phase diagram at this stage is like this. Uh, don't uh, ask me about the axis, it's just uh, to show the regions. This region one, this region two, and there's a borderline, which is three. And sooner we will eventually see and we'll be able to prove it to yourself that there is a special point at this borderline, which is called Schmidt transition. Good. So there are different types of P of E, and that leads us 
kind of two classic, uh, not that it leads uh, in mathematical science, it gives us inspiration to learn the classification of environments, which has been suggested by uh, Tony Leggett, uh, uh, Anthony got Nobel Prize. Uh, he should have gotten Nobel Prize for this, but he got Nobel Prize for something else. Sir, the beginning, the basis of the classification is to figure out how one Boson probability behaves at low energies. And there's a parameter, this is this power, this is exponent S. And it turns out that these uh, three cases I described just correspond to different values of S. If S is uh, smaller than minus one, there is a subomic regime, which is in fact classical. Superomic, which is closer to quantum. And ohmic regime, which is borderline as it has been promised. Okay. Why it's called so fancy, why ohmic is there? If the resistance is provided by electronic uh, electric circuit with the uh, ohmic resistances, it turns out that we are in this ohmic case. It makes uh, it practically um, important because yeah, not only electric circuits, many uh, environmental systems eventually provide uh, provide uh, this um, uh, type of uh, well, this exponent in one boson. Uh, in one boson uh, emission, right? And ohmic is a borderline. It can be sub or super uh, with respect to this borderline. Fine. Uh, let me first uh, address subomic dissipation. How much time I have? Not that much, but yeah, I guess I will be able to tell you about my uh, points. Right. In this case, we got back to the cartoon in the beginning of the lecture. The system is more like classical memory cell. You put it in one of the states and it stays forever, at least at zero temperature, when you don't provide any energy to your system. Well, if you provide some energy like this temperature, one can observe, well, it also can happen in memory cells. One can observe uh, very rare transitions between these two states. The rate of these transitions will be exponentially small at small energies. So the particle, the uh, qubit, uh, what used to be qubit without dissipation is now completely classical system. Right, there is a realization of the subomic uh, environment for the case of electron tunneling. In this case, one can take uh, RC line, uh, which shunts the tunnel junction in this system. Fine, that was subomic dissipation, superomic. Uh, let me uh, uh, jump, jump to here first. In this case, it's more quantum mechanical. Right, so the P of E functions like this. Uh, 
if you look at the transitions, we see that van boson processes eventually dominate. Transition rate will be power law with a certain exponent, which is related to the exponent we have. And we can make a final classification in, in, within the superomic state. So what is written here for small s, we have a bad state. For bigger state s, we have good state. What do I mean by that? One has to compare the transition rate, which depends on the distance between levels, is a level distance by itself. If it is small, if, and if it goes smaller at small energy, then it's good. Then we have a small broadening, smaller than the level width. So we have good quantum mechanical state. Right. Otherwise, we have a bad state at low energies. One cannot have already good quantization. Dissipation has, has uh, destroyed the level. The system cannot be in this level. Transition rate is too big. Uh, right. But it's uh, still uh, quantum mechanics prevails. If one looks at delocalization, delocalization is still present in, um, in uh, this test. Yeah, I forgot to, to say that in superomic state, the probability of delocalization is just zero. Uh, fine. So I look at two limiting cases. Let me, in remaining limits, concentrate on ohmic case. Let me start here. In ohmic case, Probability to emit one boson is just inversely proportional to the energy. This is probability, so it's inverse energy anyway. All right? If you integrate it over energies, you get one. So the dimension is one over, over energy. So this constant is dimensionless. And it appeared to be that the, the precise value of this constant is important. Uh, why it is important? If one takes this and elaborates uh, on um, P of E, that's what, what one gets. P of E, full probability is also a parallel but this power law will depend on a parameter, a parameter characterizing the coupling. Right? Will depend on this alpha. Uh, let me understand Again, what I said already before, let me understand uh, it in terms of bad state and good state. So I estimate transition rate. This is power law function of uh, power law with an exponent which depends on alpha. And uh, this requirement of good state uh, brings me into two situations. 
if A is sufficiently small, the state is bad. If A is bigger than one, the state is good. To understand what does it mean, bad, good. Well, if you do resonant experiment, uh, it's uh, somehow you, you can see that the broadening becomes big or the, the broadening is uh, still, still corresponds to thin lines. Uh, what does it mean, for instance, for localization? Would the particle um, stay in this uh, law? And this is uh, the statement made by this physicist, Albert Schmidt, that eventually the transition at A equals one is localization, delocalization transition. At big A, the situation is, uh, big alpha, sorry, uh, the situation is classical and the particle is localized in one of the mouth. And it is delocalized at small values of alpha, smaller values of coupling. All uh, right, to prove that one can, for instance, uh, figure out the probability this delocalization probability, correction proportional to delta squared. And uh, look how does it look like at different, um, at different um, um, alphas. Its size goes to zero, is epsilon going to zero, according to this law. Uh, so there's quantum case, or it hardly depends on Fine. This is Schmidt transition, and I guess I've done with the classification of the environment. Uh, this is the table. You can inspect this, but it just summary what I have already said. Let me finish this lecture, let me take yet another minute of your time. Uh, these are an example. You're always in with an example of our universe as dissipative environment. Uh, to this end, I have to do a little bit, uh, have to to trim a uh, spin a uh, boson model a bit, just different views. Uh, I could um, consider opposite limit of small epsilons and actually recognize that it is um, pretty much equivalent to the uh, limit we just considered. Uh, the only point that in um, in the presence of the environment we look at the transitions between plus and minus. For opposite limit, we will look at the transitions between equal weighted exponents and transition between states. And energy transfer will be different in these two cases. Instead of epsilon, we get delta. But the classification of the environment, it remains the same. Because it's about energy loss in cause of a transition, whatever the transition is. With this, we can imply it to atoms. And we can consider the transitions which is emission of light of atoms. So atom is a realization of a qubit, if you wish. Uh, right, so what did we derive uh, several lectures ago? We derived the uh, uh, rate, which dependent on energy difference, on uh, frequency, and uh, yeah, 
it contains a dipole element you remember so in total it was proportional to the third power we look at the classification of environments that brings us to super ohmic case so dissipation of atoms is pretty much uh, super ohmic which means quantum mechanics um, is preserved there, as we know from uh, numerous applications of uh, of uh, atomic physics in quantum sizes. But wait a sec. Uh, this rate was small, and the frequency dependence was small because of dipole approximation. Because in atoms dipole moments are small let's talk about bigger dipoles right to have better emission if i'm talking about antennas i have to make the size of antenna of the road or wavelengths for radio waves it results in you know in very big antennas you know all this uh, um, uh, sending nests uh, right so it must be also rotor wavelengths. If we do this, if we substitute dipole moment of the rotor wavelengths, that's what we got for P1 of E. Sure, we figure out that this is ohmic case. Moreover, alpha, which is in the exponent of ohm flow is fine structure alpha we've been talking about well it happens sir that this is structure this um, uh, this uh, constant is very small 10 to the minus two that's why all fancy effects related to ohmic uh, dissipation are very small in our world, in the world of quantum uh, electrodynamics. Uh, so the world which we know exists only because uh, alpha is sufficiently small. Good. That's what I uh, wanted to say to you. I see many of you are still uh, there. Any questions to conclude the lecture? Any questions about anything? Um, okay, I reckon you all tired by now. Me too. So it's time to conclude the lecture. Thank you for your attention, for your attendance. See you next time.